Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> Hope you're all having a good long weekend so far. It's been a beautiful weekend. I've enjoyed mine. Let's kick stuff off with uh, coming to God in prayer. So everybody join with me. Father, may your spirit move freely among us as we gather here to worship your name. You are the only one worthy of our worship and praise. We ask that your spirit would open our hearts and transform us. We ask that you would help us move from the busy everyday lives to come in this moment here with you and with each other. The struggles that we bring here with us this morning, we lay them at your feet so that we can fully turn our thoughts and attention to you. Praising you through song and prayer and reading your word and being together in this community of believers. We praise your name, remembering your love that endures forever. May our worship bring all the glory to you. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. And I will pass it off to the worship team. All right. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Hope everyone had a great weekend. Had some good time on Canada Day and all that. Uh, let's stand together and praise the Lord. Light of the world, you step down into darkness. Open my eyes, let me see. Beauty that made this heart adore you. Hope of a life spent with you. So here I am to worship, here I am to bow. Say that you're my God, you're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to me. King of all days, oh, so highly exalted, glorious in heaven above. Humbly to the earth you created, all for love's sake became poor. So here I am to worship, here I am to bow down, here I am to say that you're my God. You're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together say that you're my God. You're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to me.
Everyone needs compassion, love that's never failing. Let mercy fall on me. Everyone needs forgiveness, kindness of a Savior. The hope of nations. forever author of salvation he rose and conquered the grave Jesus conquered the grave so take me as you find me all my fears and failures fill my life again I give my life to follow Everything I believe in, now I surrender. Savior, He can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation. He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. Shine your light and let the whole world see. We're singing for the glory of the risen King. Jesus, shine your light. My God is mighty to save, he is mighty to save forever, author of salvation, he rose and conquered the grave, Jesus conquered the grave, my God is mighty to save, he is mighty to save. I only have one announcement for you today, so it'll be short. Just a reminder that uh, July 13th is our first summer uh, night event. So we are doing the free wheeling event. So we're asking everybody to bring their bikes, their scooters, any skates. Uh, and it's going to run from 4.30 until 6.30. 
We're going to have some barbecue games and just a time of family devotional together. Uh, and all the info on the events can also be found in the bulletin out in the foyer. There's also some cards right on the table as you leave the sanctuary that also have all the details for all three of the events over the summer. And uh, we'll pass it over to Borden again for the congregational prayer. <laughs> And that's the, the bulletin board you're looking for for the info. They don't look, there's no bulletins, so you, you, you haven't missed those on the way in. <laughs> Sounds like we might need that up just a touch there. Let's, uh, let's come together for our congregational prayer. Let's pray. Loving God, I give you thanks for this day. I give you thanks for this summer season that opens up some new opportunities for rest, for recreation, for reconnection for many people. These are things that you value. You created us to need rest and insisted that, in fact, we take some each week. You created us to play and seek joy, making that part of what we find life-giving. And you created us to cherish relationships just as you do, to find deep meaning in being with those we care about, perhaps some that we don't see nearly often enough. May these coming months be a time when many in our church family find renewal through these things. Be with our church family and our extended family who have need of you today. Some are facing surgeries, recoveries, uncertainties, difficult circumstances, or tough choices, and we lift them up to you. You are a healer, a stronghold, a source of strength and hope and guidance. We need you, and we know that that Al and Joao and Donna and Marg and Kim and, and Lauren and, and their families need you more than ever. And so please bless them and keep them. Show, your, show them your love and bring them your healing, we pray. During this holiday weekend, I also give you thanks for the blessings of living in Canada, where sometimes we take for granted the relative safety and stability and prosperity that we live in. And we give you thanks for the good that comes to us by being Canadians and ask you to also make us mindful of how we can lift up those who are struggling, how we can right wrongs as we see them wherever they are. Help us to love you first and then to love our country by loving its people. May your church be salt and light that you call us to be in this land, preserving what is good casting light on places your love is needed, and standing as an example of who your people are called to be as followers of Jesus Christ. In his name I pray. Amen. Please uh, remain seated for this one. Be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart, not be all else to me, save that thou art. Thou my best thought by day or by night, waking or sleeping, thy presence my I 
again. I'm just going to take a drink first. All right. So this summer we're going to be going through a new preaching, um, preaching series all about the seven traditional virtues that are in opposition to the seven deadly sins. And maybe you're not familiar with these virtues or the corresponding sins, but they're things that we don't really talk a whole lot about these days. And at the very least, we spend less time on them. But they're something that grew out of the monastic life within the Middle Ages, and they were a way to keep order. They were a way to show people what the goal was, what to aim for, and what things to avoid, and how to, how to avoid those things. But we live in a culture and a context that is heavily impacted by these things. We are impacted by pride, gluttony, lust, anger, sloth, and greed. So perhaps it's really important for us to go back to these things again, to cultivate the virtues of humility, kindness, temperance, chastity, patience, diligence, and charity. So throughout this summer, we're going to be going over one virtue at a time, and we're going to spend time focusing on these virtues, and we're going to find new ways to routinely practice good habits that will help us in our formation of character. And not just with our own ability, because we can't do these things alone, but working on in com combination with God's word and by leaning and depending on the spirit who helps us. So with that being said, today we are going to be looking at the virtue of humility. But before we look what exactly humility is, first we need to understand what it is in opposition to, and that is pride. So most often, sin turns us away from God. But pride, it's different in that it puts ourselves above God. Pride says that I am central. I don't need God or anyone else's help. I can do it on my own. The proud want to have others' approval, to have their greatness noticed, always having to prove that they are right, and often they look down on others. So in comparison, humility is to think rightly of ourselves who we are, and where we are in relation to God. So sometimes when we think of humility, we wrongly assume that it is thinking less of yourself, thinking demeaning or low thoughts about ourselves. But this is not what humility means. Humility is not thinking less of yourself, but instead thinking of yourself less. It is an honest understanding of who we are. So to highlight this concept of humility over pride, I want to read from Luke chapter 18, verses 9 to 14, which will be found on the screen behind me in a moment. I apologize to whoever brought me a glass of water. I don't trust myself without a lid. <laughs> and the scripture reads... He also told the parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and regarded others with contempt. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, was praying thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, thieves, rogues, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of all my income. 
But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift his eyes to heaven, but was beating his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his home justified rather than the other, for all who exalt themselves will be humbled, but all who humble themselves will be exalted. So we have two characters in this parable. We have the prideful Pharisee and the humble tax collector. So let's take a look at the Pharisee first. So Jesus tells of a well-respected religious leader who by his own account is following all the details of the Mosaic law. He fasts twice a week. He gives 10% of his money to the temple. He doesn't act like the thieves or adulterers or even like the tax collector. So from an outside perspective, the Pharisee was a model person. And then we have the tax collector. And we see the contrast between the two men. So unlike the Pharisee, who most likely was in a very central place in the temple, praying for all to see and hear, the tax collector, he stands far off. His eyes are down. He's beating his chest in repentance. And he just offers up a very simple prayer. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. He knows who he is. And he owns up to it. And Jesus makes his point very clear in the next verse. He says, I tell you, this man, the tax collector, went down to his home justified rather than the other, being the Pharisee. For all who exalt themselves will be humbled, but all who humble themselves will be exalted. So the Pharisee is, by all accounts, living his life in a good way. He's doing all the things that he should be doing. But Jesus, he has no words of praise for him. And instead, he says that he won't be humbled. Or sorry, he will be humbled and he will not be justified. Because even though he is living his life the right way, at least in an outward way to others, it is all, everything that he has done is ruined by his pride. The way that he compares himself to others, who he sees as beneath him, even his prayer is so pride-filled. It is so full of looking at himself. He says, look how great I am, God. And then the tax collector, on the other hand, he sees himself very clearly. He knows that he has sin in his life, and he comes before God with humility, asking only for God to be merciful to him. The difference between them, that the Pharisee, with his pride, he felt that he deserved God's blessing. Well, the tax collector knew that he did not deserve God's blessing, but he asked and he hoped for God's mercy anyway. The Pharisee wasn't looking for transformation like the tax collector was. He just wanted to be seen for how good he already thought he was. So what does this mean for us right now? How do we apply this into our lives? How do we cultivate humility? C.S. Lewis writes in Mere Christianity that the first step is to realize that one is proud. And it's a big step, too. At least nothing, whatever can be done before it. If you think you are not conceited, it means that you are very conceited indeed. Meaning that an attitude of humility, it has to begin with the awareness of our pride. And if you think that you're not prideful, you probably are. And we all struggle with pride. And cultivating humility, it needs to begin with confession. So that's my first point of application is confession. It's the first spiritual practice that will help us overcome our pridefulness and cultivate humility. And I want to be clear, I say this very, like, it sounds very simple. It is a very hard thing. It is a very hard thing to overcome our pride and to, to create this, this practice of routine confession. I was reading through Adele Cal Calhoun's book, um, Spiritual Disciplines Handbook, and she talks about confession by examining your life in light of the, deadly, the seven deadly sins, which obviously we're going to be spending a lot of time over the summer going over in connection with these virtues. And she also talks about examining your life through the Ten Commandments and prayers of confessions from prayer books or scriptures, such as Psalm 51. So confession, it's good for us. But I think that often we don't allow ourselves the time to really reflect on our lives and to confess our sins to God. And I think often it is that pride that doesn't allow ourselves to look at that sin too closely, let alone come before God and confess it. So this week, take some time and sit down and reflect and come before God in confession. 
Open yourself up to God. Allow God to transform you. Allow God to show you those areas of sin and pride in your life that you can address it. And another area of confession that will really help cultivate humility is not just confessing to God, but confessing to others. James 5.16 says, Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. When I did a, <clears throat> a short-term mission trip, the girls that I lived with, we took time at least once a week to sit down with each other and confess any sins that were in our lives, both to God and to each other. And let me tell you, voicing the sin in your life out loud to someone else is a definite way to cut the pride and humble yourself. And it was really hard at first. My pride just didn't want me to tell these girls about any negative behaviors or sin in my life because I wanted them to think highly of me. But the experience of creating that routine and opening up to other people and being vulnerable in that way was very healing for me. And as we all realized together that we all struggled with sin, we had a lot of the same issues that we were going through and sin in our lives. And it also kept each of us accountable to each other. And it created an even closer community for those weeks that we lived and ministered together. And that leads into the second way that you can cultivate humility, which is community. Because in community, pride is confronted. When we're close with each other and hold each other accountable, we need to be real with each other. And it's hard to hold up that fake mask. It doesn't allow for the fakeness of pride. In addition, being part of a community, it allows us to be a servant to others. So again, moving away from this self-only view to putting other first. And this is critical if we're trying to follow Jesus' example of a servant attitude. We can't have that me first attitude and also be a servant to others. So find those people in your community that you can be accountable with. Find those people that you can serve. The final area in which cultivates humility that I'm going to talk about today is worship. When we think of pride, it's where we're putting ourselves first. And humility is thinking of ourselves less. So the very act of worship is to turn our attention and praise to God. So when we come to God in worship, we love and we praise God. We turn all of our attention to him and we can forget about ourselves. And worship can be like what we're doing right now, coming together, singing songs of praise to God, praying, hearing his word. But worship can and should be a daily practice. So as you spend time each day with God, worshiping him in whatever way that that is, listening to music, praying, art, being in nature, just seeing with your own eyes what an amazing creator our God is, you see more and more of how big and amazing God is. And that automatically just leads to having a less of a focus on ourselves. So this is what grows humility and loses pride. And I want to be clear that all of these areas that I've talked about, they're not something that we can do alone. It's not just your own effort, because we need that help. We need Jesus' help. We can't, not only can we not do these practices without help, but it's also important to remember that the practices alone are not the thing that changes us. They are not the thing that transforms our lives. They are just the practices that make room for God to come in and work and transform our hearts. Because pride closes our hearts, and it doesn't allow for spiritual growth. But humility, it opens us up to more of God's grace. Pride prevents us from seeing our sin and brokenness and being able to accept the gift of redemption. Humility allows us to see our need for salvation and see that we cannot save ourselves. Pride has been a central factor in humanity since the fall in Genesis. And that sinful rebellion against God separated us from him. And it takes humility to realize that we are dependent on God, that the problem of sin, it can't be fixed by us, that we are dependent on God to fix our brokenness and to be restored. I want to take a minute just to come before God now in prayer, so if you'll join me. Father, we come to you now like the tax collector, with humility. We are sinners. 
and we just ask for you to be merciful to us. Help each one of us to look inside of ourselves, to see past the pride, and to see ourselves rightly, to know that we need your salvation. We cannot fix the brokenness in this world and in ourselves without you. Help us cultivate this virtue of humility, to put you first, to have an attitude of servanthood, to help bring more people back into relationship with you. Show us the areas that we need to work on this week and open our hearts to continued transformation. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, when we last came to the, the Lord's table for communion, we were still studying <clears throat> the book of 1 Corinthians, a particularly uh, a passage where in the Corinthian church, the, the wealthier people were, were hoarding the food at the love feasts, and they were letting the, uh, the poorer members of the church go home hungry, and this was a serious problem. And so the Apostle Paul even said that when you can't show mutual love and consideration to each other, and you go to, to practice communion, that's not really what you're doing. He says, that's not the Lord's Supper at all. It doesn't count. Because God is not interested in empty rituals. We see this throughout the Bible, even including the Old Testament. People bringing sacrifices with unrepentant hearts, God had no interest in that. He says, the, the act is an opportunity for our hearts to change. The act itself is not what matters. And so, the act of communion is on the, the one hand an opportunity for us to, to seek God in remembrance of Jesus Christ, to recognize all that He has done and will still do for us. But as we talked about last month, uh, in, in a special way, it's also something we do in community for a reason. It's an opportunity for us to assess our relationship with each other and also affirm our mutual love for one another that we will not be a people who harbor ill will to each other or who leave, uh, leave problems unresolved, but rather that we'll desire to be and continue to walk in full fellowship with each other. And so remembering all that, I uh, invite us to, to all take a, just a, a quiet 30 or 40 seconds of uh, just an opportunity for some reflection on where we stand before God and with one another. You who truly and earnestly repent of your sins, who have love and concern for your neighbors, who intend to live a new life following the commandment of God by walking in holy ways, draw near with reverence, faith, and thanksgiving, and take the supper of the Lord to your comfort. Come to this sacred table, not because you must, but because you may. Come to testify that you are not righteous, leaving our pride behind but that you sincerely love our Lord Jesus Christ and desire to be his true disciples. Come not because you have any claim on heaven's reward, but because in your frailty and sin you stand in constant need of heaven's mercy and help, not to express an opinion, but to seek a presence and to pray for a spirit. And now that the supper of the Lord is spread before you, lift your minds and hearts above all selfish fears and care. Let this bread and wine be to you the witness and signs of the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit. Before the throne of the Heavenly Father and the cross of the Redeemer, make your humble confession of sin, dedicate your lives to Christian obedience and service, and pray for strength to know and do the holy will of God. 
We invite all those who love the Lord Jesus, who have repented of sin, and who have decided to follow Christ in newness of life to come to this table. It is the table of the Lord. We invite uh, Deacon Art to, to come and offer uh, some prayer and scripture for our time of communion. Our scripture reading is from Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 to 25. Brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way opened for us through the curtain that is his body, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess for he who promised is faithful and let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. Let us pray. Gracious God, we have come to this place and we have gathered in your name, not because we are especially worthy, but because uh, you invited us to this spiritual feast of which we eat bread and we drink wine as a sign of your love and grace. You have written our names on cards and placed them on the table to show that you prepare a place for us in your kingdom through the broken body and shed blood of Jesus, our Redeemer. We come with minds that are sometimes confused and hearts that are longing for a glimpse of your kingdom come. We come with hopes and fears and sorrows and lay them at your feet. We come to you, Lord, with thankfulness because of the joys that we have experienced in this world and of the gifts that have been given by you. We come strengthened in faith through the preaching of your word. We come to this table, Lord, carrying the burdens of our sin and leave them here at your feet. Forgive us, gracious Father, for the sins that we have committed, that we might rise from this table confident that the body of our Lord Jesus broken and his shed blood is more than sufficient to cleanse and renew your church and renew us in fellowship with you and with one another. Lord, we pray that there may be an assurance of your presence and pardon and blessing for for all who have called upon your name in this place. Amen. On the night when he was betrayed, Lord Jesus took some bread and gave thanks to God for it. And then he broke it into pieces and he said, this is my body for which, is, for which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us eat this bread in remembrance of Christ's sacrifice to us. In the same way, he took the cup of wine after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this in remembrance of me as often as you drink it. For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are announcing the Lord's death until he comes. Jesus said, This is my blood, which confirms the covenant between God and his people. It is poured out as a sacrifice to forgive the sins of many. Drink this in remembrance of Christ's blood, which was shed for you, and be thankful.
I'll invite the worship band to come up and sing our last hymn. Please stand. Are you hurting and broken within? Overwhelmed by the weight of your sin? Jesus is calling. Have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling. to the altar the father's arms are open why forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of jesus christ leave behind your regrets and mistakes come to is calling bring your sorrows and trade them for joy from the ashes a new life is born Jesus is calling oh come to the altar the father's arms are open wide forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ oh what a savior isn't he wonderful sing hallelujah Christ is risen So, into God's gracious keeping, we would commit each other. May the Lord shine upon us and be gracious to us. May the Lord give us peace in our going out and in our coming in, in our lying down and in our rising up, in our labor and in our leisure, in our laughter and in our tears, until we come to stand before our Maker in that day in which there is no sunset and no dawn. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen.